right. You all ready to get started? All right. All right. Sounds good. Good morning. Welcome back. I'm John Hickman, one of the chief residents of maternal medicine. It's my pleasure, as always, to welcome you to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine. On behalf of our chair, Dr. Frazier, Dr. Spencer, Costco, and myself, we are really glad that you're here to join us, particularly in this uh, uh, unprecedented of times. Um, we are really happy to be joined again by the Longer Life Foundation. You'll hear more about them in a moment. Just as a brief aside, please, as always, send your questions through the Q&A or chat functions. I will help moderate those with our speaker towards the end of the talk. To tell us more about the foundation and our speaker, we are joined today again by Dr. Dan Zimmerman, Managing Director of the Longer Life Foundation. Dr. Zimmerman. Great. Well, thank you. And good morning and welcome to Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. As noted by Dr. Hickman, I am Dr. Dan Zimmerman, and I lead the Longer Life Foundation, which is a collaboration between Washington University and Reinsurance Group of America, which is based right here in Chesterfield. Now in its 24th year, the Longer Life Foundation's mission is to fund and support the study of factors that either predict the mortality and morbidity of select populations, or influence its the longevity of health and wellness. Since 1998, we have funded over 130 grants here at WashU. We have now just published our 2022 call for applications, and we will also be hosting a Q&A session on January 26th from 9 to 10 a.m. virtually uh, for people who are interested in potentially applying for a grant. The letters of intent must be submitted by February 18th. Detailed information can be found on the Washington University Research News Announcement System. With that, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Dominic Reeds, who is Associate Professor of Medicine and Medical Director, Nutrition Support Service at Barnes Jewish Hospital. Dr. Reeds also serves as the Director of the Longer Life Foundation's Longer Life Center, which is based right here on the WashU campus. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, and again, I encourage everybody to, to apply or take a look at the Longer Life Foundation website. It's an outstanding organization um, and provides funding with a big focus on clinical and translational disease and a focus towards junior investigators. So please take a look and see. Anyway, we're lucky enough this morning to have Jeff Henderson with us um, this morning. He got his BS in chemistry from Wisconsin and then completed his MD, PhD here with uh, Jay Heineke. He uh, did medicine residency in infectious disease here. And it's get the older we both get, it's getting simpler to actually just list the things that Jeff hasn't uh, actually attained yet. So he's a Burroughs Welcome Fellow and uh, co-director of the Biochemistry and Biophysics Division here. Um, he's going to be talking to us this morning about microbes, metals, and metabolomes, new approaches to resistant infections. So please take it away, Jeff. Thank you for the introduction, Dominic. Let me uh, go ahead and uh, get the presentation set up. All right, does that look good? Looks great. Great, thank you. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction, Dominic, and it's it's always a pleasure to uh, to uh, present uh, and attend Grand Rounds, of course. Uh, that's always something of a homecoming. Um, so my talk today, of course, is on microbes, metals, and metabolomes towards new approaches to resistant infections. All right, um, and you saw the conflicts of interest. I can assure you that not, none of this actually addresses what I'll be talking about today, and none of these entities has a, uh, a marketed product. Um, so, you know, just starting off, you know, this, this is about work that was funded uh, 
and, and what I'll talk about is work funded in 2013 from the Longer Life Foundation. I thought it was a uh, an opportunity to kind of update the Longer Life Foundation board on uh, what happened since they uh, published some of this initial work uh, long ago. Um, I, I give them great credit for uh, kind of jumping into the middle of this Venn diagram here. These aren't necessarily easy kinds of applications to review. Uh, the work that they were confronted with uh, back in 2013 was really an interface uh, between patient-oriented research, uh, microbiology, and biochemistry. And I, I think they navigated this really nicely. And uh, those fortunate enough to be uh, funded by a Longer Life Foundation and interact with them, we'll see there's a lot of back and forth uh, with them uh, that's just was really extremely helpful at that time. The work um, I'll talk about today and that that initial grant uh, kind of seeded uh, concerns urinary tract infections, uh, a topic that it probably needs little introduction uh, with this audience. Uh, it is, of course, one of the most common infections uh, of people. Uh, it is a extremely common reason for antibiotic prescriptions, uh, particularly in the elderly. Uh, and in nursing homes where it's the most common indication for antibiotic prescriptions, about the second most common in US hospitals, as many of you probably wouldn't find surprising, uh, and uh, the indicated is about the third most common in the outpatient setting if you look at surveys of uh, community pharmacies. Uh, it's also the most common cause of systemic E. coli infections. Uh, about 36,000 uh, deaths per year attributed to this. So people, of course, you know, even though that's an unusual outcome of a UTI, tend to take the infection quite seriously uh, for that reason. Um, and you know, going along with that, unnecessary treatment of UTIs is quite common. Uh, it tends to be overtreated. It tends to concern over it. Tends to lead to a lot of unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions. Um, recurrence is quite common. Again, uh, I'm sure no surprise to people here. Uh, those that get a UTI are more likely to have a second UTI and uh, often with age, this really becomes kind of a problematic situation. Um, and you know, as a result, prophylaxis of UTIs for those that tend to uh, recur very frequently has always been of interest uh, in this area, but of course is of concern. If you keep giving people antibiotics, uh, you will drive resistance of bacteria. Uh, and, uh, and, and kind of get yourself in greater trouble over time. Um, of course, uh, E. coli is associated with about 80% of UTIs, uh, very common in the community setting, uh, and still the most common organism even in institutional settings, though other things like Pseudomonas or E. coli's cousins like Klebsiella uh, will show up. But again, very prominent infection. As you can see in the lower right, the majority of US women will have had at least one UTI in their lifetime. Uh, men are simply a little bit late to the party here, uh, and you'll see that prevalence or cumulative probability of UTI increase uh, in men, probably starting around age 50 or so. Um, all of this, of course, is complicated by increasing antibiotic resistance, particularly of E. coli and these gram-negative uh, bacteria. Uh, and the, the trends have been kind of remarkable. Um, uh, and, and ciprofloxacin, in a pretty common oral antibiotic, really I think exemplifies this. If we if we look at data for the UK uh, on the left here, um, ciprofloxacin, for example, used to be very effective uh, for E. coli, and we saw uh, right around the uh, turn of the century, around the aughts, um, a big increase in ciprofloxacin resistance. And this is, was not just in the UK; you could see this was reflected in the trends here at Barnes Jewish Hospital. Uh, when we look at uh, ciprofloxacin uh, resistance here is the same thing. Um, I'm, uh, I, I do recall um, back in uh, starting residency how, how uh, ciprofloxacin was quite a, a you know, tended to be a, a useful antibiotic. There's very little resistance among E. coli and now we're in this, this place where it's very frequently resistant uh, in our hospital. So, you know, given the way things are going, do we new, need new antibiotics? Well, not really a, 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 you know, maybe a silly question. Of course we need new antibiotics. Um, we, we live in really an antibiotic era of medicine. Um, and we perhaps take this a little bit for granted. I, I, those of you, uh, uh, some of you may, in the audience may recognize Dr. Joseph Levitt, the late Dr. Joseph Levitt, uh, who I had the good fortune uh, to uh, be work with as the, uh, uh, ambulatory junior resident. This is uh, the two of us at his retirement party. I think right, I was at his last clinic in the Wolf Clinic. 
Um, uh, and I used to hear stories from him when he knew I was going into ID uh, about what antibiotics were like in those early days uh, when you just had penicillin or that was just becoming available. Um, but we've really taken kind of this antibiotic era um, uh, for granted perhaps uh, since uh, about World War II when uh, penicillin showed up. It's now associated with uh, hundreds of thousands of lives saved an annually, the use of modern antibiotics. Uh, since that time, there's been an increase in the average lifespan from 47 years old uh, up to where it is now. And we see a transition of major causes of death from infections uh, to non-infectious causes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, stroke, et cetera. Um, it's, of course, antibiotics are a huge number of prescriptions, uh, 270 million prescriptions for antibiotics uh, in 2015. Uh, and these are relatively well-tolerated drugs, right? Um, in fact, well-tolerated enough, there's a pretty low uh, threshold for using them. So we get a lot of unnecessary use. And, and, and my colleagues, of course, who, who I'm sure many of you have heard from, uh, sometimes uh, are, are, are doing a lot to try and uh, alleviate unnecessary prescribing of antibiotics. So antibiotics, the traditional approach of finding compounds that kill bacteria, uh, and, and wide swaths of bacteria certainly is a useful approach and will continue to be, uh, but we need to kind of maintain this pipeline. Uh, but of course, during that time, we've come to learn the downsides of antibiotics. Um, certainly we work closely with our pharmacists and I, I, I don't wanna annoy them by not noting that drug toxicity and interactions of drugs, of course, are always a downside of any drug. Uh, but with antibiotics in particular, uh, we encounter this issue of collateral damage. Um, the, the, because they're broad spectrum, because they take away uh, a normal or helpful flora, uh, they, they set patients up for other infections, right? Um, candidiasis, uh, whether it's vaginal candidiasis or thrush, uh, a well understood uh, complication, fungal complication of antibiotic use. Uh, certainly in the hospital, we all know uh, C. difficile, Clostridioides difficile infections uh, are, are certainly a, a heightened risk uh, in patients who've had uh, a lot of broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, and a lot of activity, of course, in the past 10 years has focused on what happens when we interfere, disrupt our normal intestinal microbiome and how that may infect health. Um, so these are downsides of this kind of broad spectrum antibiotic approach that we've used for the past you know, for nearly 80 years uh, at this point. And lastly, of course, a, a downside is that the more you use them right at a population level, uh, the less they work or the more you drive resistance uh, among the bacteria you're going after, just leading to this kind of cascade of, of, uh, of difficulty in finding new agents. Um, so all of these things kind of set up this question, are there alternatives to classic antibiotic approaches? Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's worthwhile in the research realm to think, well, what would really be an ideal antibiotic? What would be your perfect uh, antibiotic? And you, you could marshal an argument here that, you know, a perfect antibiotic uh, might selectively target the pathogen you're after, but minimal, minimize this collateral damage. Um, a, 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 an ideal antibiotic might avoid the resistance mechanisms that are common among medical pathogens right now. Um, it would be uh, perhaps a weak driver of resistance, uh, and that might come hand in hand with just targeting a particular uh, bacterium causing the problem. Uh, and of course, we like something that's uh, low toxicity as well. So it's good to keep, I think, keep these things in mind. But how would we get there? How would we Ident uh, identify an ideal antibiotic? Uh, how would we develop something like that? Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of, of research in uh, infectious diseases perhaps, uh, you know, sets us up for this. You know, what we need to know a little bit more about the pathogen, about the disease we're treating. Uh, and UTI really sets up nicely for this, right? It's a common disease. Uh, we have issues with resistance uh, that have been getting worse. Uh, and it's caused by a stereotypical slice of organisms, E. coli in particular. Um, so this is something we could focus on. Um, so, you know, we can ask these questions, how do E. coli and other enterobacteria like them cause infections? Uh, what can we do to prevent or stop them from doing it? Uh, and could we spare the rest of the microbiome in the process? Could we kind of selectively go after these bacteria? Uh, and so, you know, with this, I'll, I'll kind of move to this ascending model. If 
E. coli UTIs, and this is, isn't a new one. Uh, the, the urologist uh, uh, Thomas Stamey uh, articulated this model of, of UTIs in the 1970s, uh, the so-called ascending model. Uh, e. coli, of course, is no stranger to most of us. The vast majority of us are colonized with E. coli in our intestine, uh, but it remains confined, as you see at the bottom, uh, to the intestine uh, and, and a large intestine, and, and hopefully remains contained there. Uh, but in those who develop UTIs, uh, there's a decent amount of evidence that these bacteria essentially are going through this kind of ascension, right? They're, they're leaving the intestinal environment uh, and occupying uh, the urinary tract. Uh, and oftentimes this is completely asymptomatic. Um, you can have a positive culture with no symptoms and really no risk uh, for septicemia or a serious disease. Uh, but that sometimes, of course, is a stepping stone to the next step, which is cystitis. Uh, where there's actually an inflammatory response, the patient will notice pain. Uh, and uh, the next step after that, that you know, a subset of these bacteria are able to, to make this leap to pyelonephritis infection in the kidneys. From a kidney infection, it's a pretty short jump into the bloodstream at that point. Uh, but with, with this loss of containment, um, uh, you see organisms that seem to have acquired or bad E. coli that seem to have acquired some additional properties or abilities. Uh, and so that's what we'd like to focus in on. Um, and so E. coli, certainly we, we call them a single bacterial species. We've all heard of these. Um, but as bacteria go, it's a really genetically variable organism. It has a huge, almost open genome. There's a lot of extra genes that may be in one strain of E. coli that are not in another. Um, and it, it appears a lot of these accessory genes, uh, you may call them, uh, expand the ability of E. coli to, to grow in tissue sites outside of the intestine kind of take them off road, if you will. If we look at what some of these genes do, they do a lot of different things. Um, they're not necessary for survival of the organism, but they do seem to help the organism E. coli uh, occupy these other sites. Some of these are involved in nutrient acquisition, which uh, you might guess by the title we'll talk about today, particularly with iron. So iron is a nutrient that limits uh, bacterial growth, particularly that of E. coli. Um, there are adhesion factors, the ability of these bacteria to stick to different tissues uh, can be encoded on these extra genes. Uh, there are toxins uh, that may disable components of the innate immune system and uh, allow a bacteria to kind of evade that. Uh, and although we don't classically consider E. coli an encapsulated organism, in fact, a lot of these accessory genes sometimes can uh, encode the means to encapsulate uh, E. coli uh, and with that kind of give them the ability to resist uh, host immune cells. So um, I'll, I'll just mention briefly some studies we've done and there's been other studies like this certainly with E. coli, but uh, with uh, some early work with Jonas Marshall, um, he, he collected uh, E. coli isolates from Barnes Jewish Hospital uh, and looked at the patients that uh, yielded to them and um, we could pull out of these a, a group of patients that had catheter-associated UTIs, that had fever and the presence of E. coli in the urine. And he all, we, we also could pull out uh, from this collection a group of bacteria uh, that came out of the urine, but the patient had no fever, no, no indication that they had any symptoms at all, uh, but a catheter was present. Uh, and then we also pulled, just for comparison, uh, and this was work with Bill McCoy, uh, uh, rectal colonizers, so E. coli strains uh, isolated from the rectum. In this case, we didn't go to patients, we went to the uh, providers of the patients, and actually the house staff was nice enough to provide self-collected swabs for many of these. Um, and so we could compare the E. coli that were causing problems in patients, uh, those that were present in the wrong place in patients, but not making people sick, and then those E. coli that were in the right place uh, in just uh, asymptomatically colonizing the intestine. And here is a, a, a dendrogram, we're looking at relatedness based on all of these accessory genes. And we can see the bacteria cluster, if you look at the top, into these classical E. coli phylogenies, B2, F, A, B1, E, and D. Um, but as you go further down the tree, um, you see groupings. And at the bottom, color-coded, you could see in red, uh, that the catheter-associated UTI are not randomly assorted among all of these lineages, but in fact, 
in fact, are largely collected over at the left side of this uh, dendrogram uh, in a tight kind of the small branches of the tree. Uh, and what this indicates is there's a lot of genetic relatedness among the bacteria that caused an actual infection that made people sick, caused fever. Uh, and, and, and these are systematically different bacteria than all the rest of them that either caused, uh, for the most part, um, asymptomatic bacteria or uh, uh, colonized the intestine. So when we dig into what makes those strains different, uh, we see a lot of these accessory genes, but some of the really interesting ones that come out of this are, are those associated with uh, iron uptake. Uh, and so I'll introduce you here with this slide uh, to siderophore systems. Uh, so that siderophore is Greek for iron carrier. Uh, and what it is, uh, these, are, these are genetic uh, modules within the E. coli genome that, in, that encode or biosynthetic machinery to make a small molecule chelator. Um, so this is, an, in, in this case, a, a chelator capable of binding iron-3 or ferric iron. Uh, so these are secreted outside the bacteria, uh, and they basically bind with extraordinarily high affinity iron ions, um, and they form a complex. That complex is recognized by an import protein uh, in E. coli brought into the cell, uh, and the cell can extract, and it depends on the kind of siderophore, but it can extract that iron back off. Uh, and use it uh, as a nutrient. Um, so E. coli strains can encode up to four of these, in fact. All of them have at least one of them, uh, but there are varying numbers of additional ones, which is kind of interesting, but it presents uh, a, a kind of special metabolic pathway uh, for siderophore biosynthesis that is uh, potentially amenable uh, to pharmacologic inhibition. Um, so how do we look at siderophores? Well, you know, we can't run a, we can't run PCR to look for them. We can't run a gel to look for them. These are small molecules, uh, and what we do in the lab frequently is use mass spectrometry uh, to identify these. Um, this is something they, I did back here at WashU with uh, the late John Turk and with uh, Jay Heineke, my thesis advisor, and we've kind of moved this to looking. Uh, in more detail at these unusual compounds that bacteria make during infections. Uh, an electrospray max spectrometer is uh, on the lower left, it's something we have in the lab. One of the early things we wanted to know is whether these systems are actually turned on during infection at all. Certainly these bacteria carry the genes, it doesn't mean they're turned on or activated uh, during infection. Uh, so what we did was we took urine from somebody or from a number of patients uh, with E. coli UTIs. Uh, and ran it through a mass spectrometer uh, and looked to see whether uh, these siderophores are produced. Um, my apologies early in the morning for showing chemical structures, uh, flashbacks to organic chemistry for some, but if we're looking at small molecules, it's unavoidable, right? Um, so enterobactin is, is this classic uh, siderophore made really by all E. coli, the structure of it's on the right. Uh, and I, I've uh, circled uh, the benzene rings here, you can see on the upper right in green. Uh, and so these are catechols, and, and this molecule has catechols on it because catechols bind iron really well. Uh, and so this is a really good iron binder. Uh, if we extract the urine from patients with UTI and compare it to a healthy donor with no uh, E. coli in the urine, uh, we run through the LCMS and we know it's there because of this peak of material and uh, you see a peak um, uh, that corresponds to enterobactin in those with cystitis. Uh, a healthy individual does not have this peak and we can include a carbon-13 labeled internal standard, uh, uh, which is a heavy isotope labeled version, just so we know exactly where this comes out. So it turns out E. coli make uh, siderophores uh, during uh, UTIs. Um, so why do E. coli need this? Why would this be useful in the context of an infection? Uh, well, it's, it would be no secret uh, to those uh, in hematology and those of us who've studied hematology, right? Uh, humans have a lot of means to control the availability of iron, right? Uh, we all know transferrin, right? So this is a circulating iron transport protein uh, that binds these ferric ions. Certainly ferritin, an iron storage protein, binds and stores a lot of them. Um, and there are all sorts of means actually that your body has to control the availability of iron, whether it's iron ions or hemoglobin and, uh, and heme. 
Uh, the one we'll focus on today is uh, one called Sideracalin or Lipocalin 2. This is an iron binding protein. Uh, we don't usually measure clinically, but it turns out it's turned on uh, in cells uh, that undergo inflammatory stimulus. And in fact, it's preloaded into neutrophils uh, and white blood cells. And it is understood to be some, a protein that limits iron availability. So uh, in some work with uh, a former uh, graduate student of the lab, Robin Shields Color, Robin wanted to know whether uh, sideracalin uh, is produced during urinary tract infections. Uh, and we knew that it's turned on at least in a mouse model of infection. And in fact, it's turned on by cells that are close to collections of bacteria in the bladder, as you can see on the left. Uh, if, you, if you're able to do transcriptional analysis in a cell-by-cell -cell basis, you see that the cells, the epithelial cells closest to these collections of, of E. coli make uh, the most or have, have the most uh, highly upregulated amount of lipocalin 2. Uh, Robin simply looked in UTI outpatients uh, using an ELISA in this case and looked for sideracalin in the urine uh, and found that yes, uh, sideracalin is produced and in uh, quite a hefty amount uh, in those with UTI. Uh, so this with cystitis had a fair amount of, uh, of sideracalin produced and evident uh, in the urine itself. Uh, one thing we wanted to look at was whether sideracalin actually inhibits E. coli growth in human urine. Um, the ability to, of E. coli to grow in urine looks like a virulence adaptation. This is something E. coli strains that, are, that come from the urine are able to do quite well is grow in it. Um, if you grow rectal strains and uh, urinary strains in, in rich media, they grow at the same rate. Uh, if you put them into urine, the urinary strains grow faster. Uh, so we wanted to evaluate how, um, how sideracalin may change this calculus. Um, and Robin found a really interesting thing here, which is that indeed sideracalin can function to limit bacterial growth in human urine if, if he takes normal human donors uh, and adds sideracalin to it and grows E. coli in it, uh, it can work, but it, it's hugely variable. Uh, some individuals have a urine that cooperates really beautifully with sideracalin, and other individuals have a, a urine that really doesn't permit much sideracalin activity at all. Uh, and the more he looked at this, the more he could kind of uh, stratify uh, just normal human urine donors for this study as restrictive, meaning that their urine cooperated really well with sideracalin. Uh, and others who uh, he called permissive, meaning uh, sideracalin really had no effect, uh, little activity. Um, so kind of curious, right? We know that UTI has a lot of individual variation in terms of susceptibility. Some people never get it. Some people get it all the time. Uh, and we're often kind of frustrated as physicians about what to do about that and, and what's going on. So this was kind of, I thought, an interesting insight uh, in, into a, a human uh, difference. Um, but it, it begs the question, right? What what is this? What does this come from? Um, what affects sideracalin activity um, in urine? Uh, and there's a lot of possibilities here, right? Urine is nothing if not complex. Um, there's a lot of things in it, uh, and if we, you know, being a mass spectrometrist, who I guess we we weigh molecules a lot, we'll consider this as a function of weight. Um, you know, it could be cells. Well, we've we've spun all the cells out of that, but there are exosomes in urine, there are proteins, there are smaller peptides, there's lots of small molecules there, uh, there's metal ions, and at, at the extreme end, there's differences in pH. Um, all of these things we consider as potential contributors to uh, sideracalin activity, um, but we decided to focus on the left side here on the small side uh, of the equation uh, and see if any of these things impacted this. And we went through kind of a, a fairly simplistic group of things in the table in the upper left. We looked at the age of the donor. We looked at how much sideracalin was already in the urine. We compared specific gravity of the urine uh, to see if there was just more stuff in, in one kind of urine than another. We looked at pH and we used ICPMS uh, to look at uh, metal ion content. Uh, and the only thing in that initial swoop uh, that came out as different in restrictive or permissive urines uh, was pH. Uh, so those whose urine cooperated with sideracalin were restrictive, had a, tended to have a higher urinary pH than those uh, who had a permissive urine. 
somewhat counterintuitive. We often think of trying to acidify the urine to limit bacterial growth, but that's that's not what we saw here. Those with a more alkaline urine um, uh, were more likely to have a urine that cooperated with siderocalin. Um, and you can see on the on the bottom here, if we if we look at siderocalin activity as a function of pH. Um, it, it tends to increase as you move to the right here towards this pH above 6.4. The great thing about pH is it's easily manipulated, right? And we wanted to see whether this was, a, uh, you know, just correlation or was this causation. Um, so uh, Robin repeated his experiments uh, on the right side after uh, alkalinizing the urine with bicarb. Uh, and this is all in the physiologic range. So with bicarb, sure enough, he could convert some of these uh, 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 permissive urines into restrictive urines, as you see, uh, adding bicarb move them from the left to the right. Uh, he would acidify the urine uh, on the on the other side of this of restricted people, uh, and uh, on and by adding HCl, and you could see that as he did that, siderocalin didn't work very well anymore. So this he could see, you know, was a big part of this uh, pH. Um, Sidericalin works better as you get towards uh, a neutral pH or six, a pH above 6.4. Um, so that's clearly part of the explanation here, uh, but it's not the whole thing. Um, just having a pH over 6.4 certainly didn't guarantee that somebody had a, a restricted urine, just increases uh, the chances of that. So we went up um, an, another level to look at the small molecule composition of urine to see if that had an influence on this. Um, so this is where we get into it from the title metabolomics, right? So this is the broad scale study of small molecules um, um, and, and particularly uh, those associated with life. Um, there's really two major ways to do this. One is by NMR, uh, the other by mass spectrometry. We certainly favor mass spectrometry here for doing this. Um, and you yield a lot of things, you know, uh, urine is where you're Molecule, your body sends small molecules to go to go away, right? You eliminate drugs there, you eliminate all sorts of things in the urine. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities and you need kind of multivariable statistics and, and things like this to sort through them properly and make sure you're not overfitting your data, et cetera. Um, but this is the approach we used here. We're, what we're looking for is whether there is a small molecule correlate of restrictive uh, urine. Um, so we ran uh, a, a set of urines through this, um, compared those that were permissive and restrictive for their small molecule content. Um, I'm not going to go through all the multivariable statistics here and the chemical analysis where we break these molecules apart in, a, in the gas phase inside the mass spectrometer, but I'll kind of give you the punchline here. Uh, we can go through and identify a number of these uh, chemically, and what we ended up with here uh, was a nice positive correlation between uh, a category of metabolites in the urine called these catechols again, uh, and you can see that on the bottom left, and uh, restrictive uh, cooperation with siderocalin in the urine. So the more catechol type compounds uh, the, the, pay, the, the donor had in their urine, the better siderocalin worked. Um, so in this bubble plot, we put everything kind of together here, right? On the x-axis is increasing pH of the urine. On the y-axis is increasing catechol content. Uh, and in a bubble plot, the larger the bubble, the larger the circle here, uh, the more siderocalin activity there was. Uh, so you can see as you alkalinize the urine and increase its content of catechols, you get better activity, better antibiotic activity uh, of siderocalin. So all of this is nicely correlated uh, uh, in this graph, right? So where do these catechols come from? Um, you know, we often think if we're doing metabolomics in people, we're looking at things that human cells make. Uh, not so much the case here. Um, if you delve through the literature, and there's a lot of literature that kind of, you know, gives you an idea for each of these, not in a lot of detail, but the general idea we get is that these catechols we found are not catecholamines, they're not neurotransmitters. Uh, but in fact, are dietary products. These, and and the more you look at it, it it's uh, these are from this is from plant matter in the diet. It's from things like dietary polyphenols, uh, which are uh, processed uh, by the uh, uh, the microbiota of the intestine uh, into smaller pieces. And in that process, in many cases, you liberate uh, these catechol compounds. There, these are then absorbed in the intestine uh, and uh, secreted uh, in the urine. 
um, where they show up in our assay. So this is where we think these catechols are coming from uh, plant matter uh, in the diet um, that's been processed probably by uh, microbes in the gut. Um, so how does this work? Why, why are these catechols important uh, for sidericaline activity? Uh, this has been the function or the, the, the focus of Lindsay uh, Steinberg, who's an MSTP in the laboratory. And what I'm showing you here is a crystal structure of sidericaline. So this is the, you know, what the mole molecule looks like uh, at a small level. And I'll point you to the one, two, three in the middle. Uh, this thing has a pocket uh, in, in the middle, and um, which uh, appears to have something to do with its function. And uh, as we delve into what this is doing, um, Lindsay's model here is that the, the reason sidericaline uh, cooperates with urinary catechols is because it, these catechols go through a self-assembly process where they bind iron. Uh, recall I said catechols bind iron very well, can bind three of them in this uh, hexacoordinate shell of iron three, uh, and it fits really nicely into this pocket it turns out, uh, and the, the orange ball you see there is iron. So basically this protein immobilizes iron. It uses these, uh, these catechols as grips, if you will, as cofactors to bind this iron uh, in the center and make it presumably uh, harder for bacteria to access. Um, it turns out that the ability of sidericalin to do this is optimal at higher pHs. If you lower the pH, this uh, sidericalin basically releases these catechols and the whole thing comes apart. So it's exquisitely pH sensitive. Um, so it's a nice model. Um, Lindsay has been testing this model and, and has done this with purified components. So in this case, this is a culture in which we no longer use urine, but we use uh, kind of a, a simulant of urine, if you will, uh, a, me a defined medium where we know what's in it. Uh, in this case, she's adding um, sidericalin uh, on the bottom trace uh, or not adding it on the top. And then she's titrating in catechol and she's looking at uh, E. coli growth uh, on the y-axis here. Uh, and what she sees, the more catechol she adds, uh, the less growth she sees. And, and basically uh, she can rapidly bring growth down to barely above what the inoculum was. So basically the bacteria they're around, but they're, they're, they haven't grown or expanded. Uh, and, and that effect uh, takes place over many orders of magnitude. So indeed, it looks like these two things cooperate very nicely uh, to limit the growth of bacteria. It's, sitter, it's sideracalin dependent, uh, of course. So um, this is, again, the model here. Um, we have this self-assembly of urinary catechol metabolites. It grabs any available iron in the vicinity of uh, of these bacteria as sidericalin is turned on, it organizes these into a uh, relatively inaccessible bound iron catechol complex at high pH. Um, so all of this kind of begs the question, right? Could we therapeutically potentiate any of these things? Um, if, the, if these sound like good things to have, they would limit the growth, or at least they do in vitro, of uh, E. coli in a urinary type environment. Uh, could we um, add, could we, do something about this. So, you know, an easy way to test this is to just execute this strategy, right, uh, in urine of somebody that's permissive. And um, so this is an example of that here. We're, we're growing E. coli um, in culture. Uh, if we add sidericalin by itself, again, this is a, a permissive urine, so it doesn't do anything. But if we then add bicarbonate and catechols at a physiologically plausible concentration, we see a big drop in uh, the CFE were the, the number of live bacteria uh, in the culture. So it, it kind of works in this ex vivo circumstance. Um, I had mentioned siderophores, of course, and it turns out that anaerobactin, that, that uh, siderophore that's in all E. coli, uh, has some ability to compete with siderocalin to get iron. So if we take a strain of the bacteria that doesn't make it uh, an anaerobactin null mutant for which Enterobactin production has been knocked out. Uh, we see an even greater inhibition of uh, bacterial growth on the right side. This mutant really isn't able to compete even a little bit uh, uh, with, um, with, uh, with sidericalin and catechols. Um, so uh, could we make a drug that does this? Could we, could we uh, inhibit this uh, siderophore biosynthetic pathway? Human cells don't have a pathway, anything like this really. Uh, so it's a, an attractive target. 
Uh, so I, I got in touch with Courtney Aldrich, who's an excellent pharmaceutical chemist uh, at the University of Minnesota, has looked at compounds like this, and it turned out he had a compound on the shelf that looks like uh, an intermediate in, in enterobactin biosynthesis. That's the inhibitor uh, down in the lower left. So we uh, looked to see if that inhibitor uh, could block bacterial growth in human urine, and that's on the right side. Here we are looking at growth of an E. coli strain from one of our patients in the hospital here at Barnes uh, that had E. coli in the urine that had jumped into the bloodstream. Um, and we're looking at growth. If we add the inhibitor by itself without sideroquinolone, it doesn't really do anything. Bacteria still grow in the black bar here. Uh, as you add sideroquinolone, yeah, you get a little bit of an effect from that sideroquinolone. So this is a somewhat permissive urine. Uh, but if you add this inhibitor on top of that, you really shut down growth completely. Um, so again, it looks like these um, siderophores might be a part of uh, any kind of um, uh, inhibitory or therapeutic strategy here. So that's that's kind of where we're we're moving some of this work uh, is to is to consider ways to maybe augment uh, or synergize uh, with uh, innate uh, immune functions uh, in our patients uh, by al alkalinizing the urine is fairly straightforward. We know how to do that, and in fact, there's there's over the counter uh, uh, bicarb or citrate packets that are sold in pharmacies in Europe to alkalinize urine of people with UTI. We don't do that so much here. Uh, but it, it, it has been, has been done. Um, uh, and if we come up with ways to, to supplement catechols, either by directly giving them or uh, with diet, um, that's a possibility. It may be dependent on the microbiota a person has, whether that works. Um, and of course, we could consider things like CIDR for biosynthetic uh, inhibitors. Um, and so for the second part of the talk here, I just want to check the time. Um, great. I'm going to talk about one other Siderophore system uh, in, in some of these bacteria. And here we're again focusing on the, the real bad guys, the ones that um, caused a symptomatic infection. So, again, if I, I bring you back to this dendrogram, if we look at the lower left, uh, I mentioned there's all these extra, um, these extra genes uh, that are involved in iron uptake. And it turns out all of these strains uh, the, inside the red circle here encode uh, a second Siderophore. Uh, called Yersinia bactin. Um, so just to talk about that, you might guess from the name, Yersinia bactin was originally uh, found in Yersinia pestis. So it turns out this is the main siderophore of Yersinia pestis, of the plague, has a really important role, it turns out, in uh, plague pathogenesis. And uh, even more curiously, it's the, the, this island of genes that encodes this system is virtually identical in your pathogenic E. coli to what you find in your Sinia pestis in the Black Death. Um, and I've outlined above it, the, the island of genes. It, it, it has the ability to be mobile in the way we think about antibiotic resistance. Um, and this inserts into the genome of, of E. coli. And it's actually quite sophisticated compared to a lot of Siderophore systems. This is a group of genes that has uh, transports, uh, transport proteins, has regulatory proteins, has uh, biosynthetic proteins that are arranged into four distinct operons. Uh, I mentioned uh, it has its own regulators, so it kind of regulates itself. So there's a, it's clearly much more sophisticated than a lot of um, other siderophores, and that kind of piqued our interest. Uh, and it really begs the question, you know, if enterobactin works well, and I just gave you an example of something it can do, why do these bacteria make a second siderophore? What possible use could that be? Um, and so uh, a past graduate student, Kaveri Parker, looked at this, uh, and she took advantage of the fact that, he, that uh, using uh, LCMS metabolomics, we can actually detect the metal that these siderophores bind. And we consider the possibility that your cinebactin doesn't just bind iron, maybe it binds something else. How would we figure that out? Well, we purified it uh, and, and threw it into uh, a urine specimen, ran it in the LCMS and looked to see what metal it came back with. Certainly we saw a little bit of iron uh, ferric yersiniobactin complex in there, but we had a new peak, which is always exciting. So there's a new form of yersiniobactin that showed up when we did this analysis. And what this was, it turns out it was binding copper. It actually did this really well. Uh, and um, we went quickly to uh, patients uh, from the hospital 
uh, with, uh, with uh, E. coli urinary tract infection and looked for this copper complex. And sure enough, we could detect cupertheurcinibactin uh, in the urine of patients uh, with E. coli UTIs. You can see this on the left. Um, for those of you who really like chemistry, uh, you can see the two naturally occurring isotope peaks of copper 63 and 65. Uh, it's, it's a nice kind of uh, fingerprint uh, uh, telling you that definitely this, this thing is bound copper. When we look in the urine to see what metal it's bound in these patients, it turns out the majority of it, of Yersinia back then is bound not to iron, uh, but to copper instead. So it's, it's, this Siderophore is very engaged as a copper binder, which was curious. There's nothing in the literature about this. Um, why would it do this? Um, well, we, we went to the literature, of course, uh, and we found that just down the road at University of Missouri, uh, there was somebody that stu studies copper biology. And uh, this person just happened to stumble on uh, the, this finding that in, in macrophages, in phagocytic cells, of course, that, that respond to infections in many cases, um, there is a copper transport system that brings copper into the cell. Uh, and that during phagocytosis, when macrophages engulf bacteria, these cells move ATP7A, which is a, a copper transporter, into the phagolysosome. So basically, these bacteria, of course, are, are engulfed in this subcellular compartment. And it turns out these macrophages put a copper transporter into the wall of that and start shooting copper, transporting copper in uh, around the bacterium. It turns out um, copper is quite toxic actually to bacteria. And actually knowledge of this goes back to the ancient Egyptians who used it as a preservative and so forth. That's a kind of interesting history there. Uh, but it, it, and the bottom line here is it looks like copper can be used as an antibacterial effector uh, in phagocytic cells. So put two and two together with our finding, um, and we begin to wonder whether your Yersiniobactin protects E. coli from copper toxicity. Uh, so we tested this in culture. Uh, if, you, if you just grow bacteria in culture, yeah, you, you get growth. If you add copper, you can see them die. And if you precondition the culture with your Yersiniobactin, you can completely block that, that uh, toxic effect from copper. So it's, uh, it's something that we thought maybe the Yersiniobactin protects uh, E. coli or bacteria from phagocytic cells. And it turns out this system actually, you know, classically it responds to iron, but we found it responds in a very different way to the presence of copper. So this is a siderophore system that's turned on in the presence of copper, which really distinguishes it from all the other siderophore systems that have been described. George Katumba, a graduate student in lab, just had a nice paper just came out this week, um, showing that uh, that this this siderophore system, despite being known as an iron acquisition system, responds exquisitely sensitively to copper and really up, ramps up its production. Um, so we have a, a copper activated siderophore here. Um, we look to see whether the ability to make your Yersiniobactin helps these E. coli survive inside phagocytic cells. Uh, and so um, uh, th these are some data from a culture system. Uh, and if we, uh, if we look at the ability of UTI-89, which is a wild type pure pathogen to survive within cell in, in macrophage-like cells, yeah, we can see it survives there. If we knock out or remove their ability to make your Yersiniobactin, that's the Delta YBTS here, uh, we see they're really efficiently killed uh, in these cells. If we then grow, repeat the whole experiment in a condition where copper uh, was, was kind of eliminated or removed from the media, there's no longer any advantage to making your Yersiniobactin. So the, the whole thing looks consistent with a copper dependent killing defect or copper in, in, uh, in uh, macrophages. So these, these E. coli seem to make this uh, and it allows them to uh, resist copper. So our model of copper control of Yersiniobactin is you, you find these environments where copper shows up and uh, E. coli it, um, are making, always making in these low iron environments, uh, siderophore, um, and Yersiniobactin goes and starts grabbing these copper ions and basically neutralizing them so that they don't get into the cell. The cell brings them in in a controlled manner and it turns out the, they activate this, um, this response mechanism. Uh, and they make more Yersiniobactin and pretty much they go until they've, they've gobbled up or uh, controlled all the copper in their local environment. Uh, and so this is a concept where we, we call nutritional passivation. Uh, the, this copper is retained as in, it, it, be, 
is still nutritionally available to bacteria, but it's no longer uh, toxic to them. Right, so this is nutritional passivation here. Um, is, does this really happen, right? So we, I've, I've described a lot of uh, in vitro uh, kind of culture experiments. Does this happen in a model of infection? So there is a, a murine model, a mouse model of a cystitis of uh, bladder infection. Uh, and we went ahead and compared the ability of a wild type pure pathogen to a Yersinia bactin null mutant uh, to cause infection. In this particular mouse model, uh, it's a binary output. Basically, uh, about half the mice develop a high titer inflammatory cystitis that kind of looks clinically like what we see in people, lots of immune cells, uh, a high titer of bacteria in the bladder tissue. You see bacteria coming out in the urine. Uh, and then about the other half of these go into a low titer, low inflammation, almost colonization state with uh, far less uh, immune function uh, or, or immune activity. Uh, and sure enough, uh, in a Yersinia bactin null strain, um, this, happen this high titer inflammatory state uh, is, is quite rare. It really significantly drops the enough proportion of bacteria that go into that. So it looks like it plays a role uh, in, in UTI in a model system. Um, so uh, Yichuan Su uh, in our lab um, had worked with Shannon Olemaker. Shannon's currently at the NIH, uh, was a past graduate student, uh, at identifying inhibitors of Yersinia bactin biosynthesis. So we wanted to know whether we could pharmacologically, pharmacologically mimic uh, this result. Uh, and so they identified a compound that shuts down and looks like it very selectively shuts down Yersinia bactin production. It doesn't kill bacteria, it just shuts down Yersinia bactin. Um, and uh, so they, they kind of re repeated this experiment uh, in mice here. And, and uh, the early results from this are that indeed it does act very much like uh, this Yersinia bactin knockout. And we see uh, a, a nice therapeutic effect here uh, in this mouse model uh, of infection. So uh, to summarize, um, I, I took you through a, a, you know, some of our research that was really stimulated uh, uh, some of this by the, that initial Longer Life Foundation in, uh, grant in 2013. Uh, what we found and, and really stemming from that was that catechol supplementation is an interesting possible nutritional strategy uh, to potentiate antibacterial immunity. How to implement that is an open question, uh, but it looked plausible uh, and certainly in, in in concert with uh, alkalinizing urine, urine that, that is a plausible route to doing this without using antibiotics. Um, we, we can see that these siderophore systems of E. coli are associated with pathogenic potential of the organism, um, that they work in multiple ways. And we can learn a little bit about the innate immune, immune system, uh, as you can see in the process of understanding these siderophores. Uh, and I think it's really interesting, you know, these siderophores look like plausible prophylactic or therapeutic targets. They, the biosynthetic pathways are quite specific uh, to these pathogens. They're unlike, they're categorically unlike anything that human cells make. Uh, so I, I wouldn't expect a lot of cross-reactivity with human uh, cellular pathways as we target these more carefully. Um, and these are also things that are turned on selectively during infection. In fact, uh, a siderophore inhibitor probably wouldn't even affect uh, intestinal colonization. It would, just, it would just help contain the bacteria to the intestine. It would make these bacteria less able, I think, uh, to invade tissues uh, and take up residence there. So uh, just a, a quick uh, note of gratitude to all the people that have contributed to this work over time uh, in the current uh, members of the lab, uh, the lab alumni, which I kind of uh, mentioned to you along the way. Of course, I'm not sharing a lot of their work that led up to this. I'm giving you somewhat of a top line uh, summary to this, but there's been just a really blessed to have worked with a lot of really capable uh, people here, as well as some wonderful collaborators, uh, both here at WashU uh, and elsewhere. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful, Dr. Hannison, thank you so much for your talk and for your excellent work. Really appreciate you being here today. And uh, thanks again also to the Longer Life Foundation. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here uh, just so I can get folks the QR code. While I do that, let me throw this question at you in the chat from one of our ID fellows, Dr. Patrick Olson says, can siderophores be detected in urine from asymptomatic bacteria patients? And therefore, could siderophore detection be used as a potential diagnostic to distinguish between asymptomatic bacteria versus true infection? 
Yeah, that's really an excellent question. Um, you know, we haven't, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to go find people that are asymptomatically infectious. They can't tell you that they have an infection to collect the urine, but I can tell you anecdotally, we have seen exactly that in our N of one, uh, somebody who was a, an asymptomatic donor of urine uh, and, and was kind of intended to be in the control group. Indeed, we saw cupricusinia back then in their urine. Uh, and sure enough, there was a, that you could culture E. coli out of there. So um, yeah, I, I don't know that it would distinguish, uh, or at least that sidereophore would necessarily distinguish asymptomatic bacteriuria from, uh, from an infection. But I completely agree with the sentiment here. Um, we all know that we have patients that can't give us symptoms uh, and may have a positive culture or something like that. And sometimes there are reasons to wonder whether they have an infection or not. Um, so I, I, I agree with the sentiment of that question. That's, that's something we're still looking after and, and we're using other metabolomic approaches to distinguish uh, asymptomatic bacteria from infection. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dr. Reeds asks, uh, have you identified any candidate small molecule inhibitors for your ciniabactin that are unlikely to affect host copper metabolism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that last one I mentioned uh, is definitely, it's, there's no reason to believe it would affect uh, host copper metabolism. Uh, it is, uh, it's something we identified in a, a, a semi-rational screen, as we might say. We didn't look through thousands of compounds, but we knew enough about the biochemistry of our system to narrow in on a set of, of, of compounds. We thought we could kind of slip a wrench into the system. Um, so uh, that compound we evaluated and appeared to have infection and appeared to have activity in an infection model. Um, really shouldn't interfere with uh, host copper metabolism. So that's, yeah, I, I think that is one possible um, possible lead compound for that. Great. Uh, one of our questions in the chat, we always hear about cranberry juice and, and UTIs. Did you look at cranberry juice providing urine uh, catechols or siderocalin? Yeah, that's a, that, so that's really a great point. And it, I love it, you know, cranberries always come up, right, uh, in, in UTI talks. Um, and there's certainly been studies, you know, some people have a study to show one way, some another way. And, you know, some of the larger ones don't show a benefit. Um, it's, you know, it's possible that it's much more complicated than just providing a cranberry product. Certainly cranberry juice and a lot of these things do have some polyphenols in them. Uh, whether it's enough to adequately increase catechol concentrations, I don't know. We haven't looked at, at doing that. Um, there's, uh, you know, a lot of other possible, um, the, the literature we looked at for providing catechols was actually, uh, so coffee uh, has a lot of compounds. Yeah. Um, that, uh, yeah. <laughs> coffee, tea, chocolate, uh, you know, red wine. I, I really, you know, I, this is all fantastic news, this right? That's news. really going. true. <laughs> Uh, so all the things we love to eat and drink, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of them that if you look through some of the nutritional literature do result in these catechol compounds showing up. But uh, there's not, you know, that, that's something we look to in the future to kind of identify what some of these precursors are. It could be even more complicated, you know, if you require some sort of uh, microbiome composition to fully yield those. And that, that could lead to a lot of um, kind of idiosyncratic uh, effects, shall we say. So there, you know, it's possible cranberry juice could, in the right person, uh, in the right urine pH, could yield the effect you're looking for, but by itself, it might not be enough. Gotcha. Well, with that, we're right at about nine o'clock. Uh, Dr. Reeds or Dr. Zimmerman, any final thoughts you'd like to pass on before we head out? No, th thanks very much for such a stimulating um, discussion, Jeff. It's amazing to see, I think for everybody, in the audience here, how you can go with a big brain, you can go so quickly from really basic science innovations into patients and then back and really back and forth between the two. I think it's just incredible to see you do it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, a lot of, a lot of great people helping me and um, it's just fun to bring a lot of people, a lot of different expertise to the table to, pro to solve problems like this. Thank you. Right. And thank you too. We're really proud to have supported your work, Dr. Henderson. Absolutely. Thank you very much.
I'll echo my thanks as well. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the Longer Life Foundation for joining us. Thank you to everyone. And just as an aside, you know, thank you to all our house staff and providers, everyone who's fighting during this incredibly difficult time. Um, hang in there, take care of one another, get boosted, please. And uh, we will hopefully see you next week at our next grand round. So take care, everyone. Thank you.